Critical thinking rule 12. Analogies require relevantly similar examples. An argument by analogy is one that infers that because two things are alike in one way, they must also be alike in another way. Here's an example. Cars are like human bodies in that they are both complex systems with interacting parts that serve a function. Cars should be checked regularly by a mechanic. Therefore, people should be checked regularly by a doctor. You'll notice the first premise makes a comparison between cars and human bodies. All arguments by analogy contain this type of comparison or analogy as one of their premises. Don't confuse an argument by analogy with an argument for an analogy. An argument for an analogy would try to prove an analogy as its conclusion. Arguments by analogy contain an analogy as a premise, and then they use that to prove something else about one of the objects. Arguments by analogy are logically invalid. That means that even if the premises are true, the conclusion can still be false. Here's an example. Cats are like dogs because they are both carnivorous mammals with fur, whiskers, and tails. Cats meow. Therefore, dogs meow. Both premises are true, but the conclusion is false. That shows that this argument is invalid. Because all arguments by analogy share the same logical form, they are all invalid. Invalid just means not logically valid. Valid means if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Even though arguments by analogy are all invalid, they can still be strong. Logically strong means that if the premises are true, then the conclusion is probably true. The premises don't guarantee the truth of a conclusion in a strong argument, but they do make it more probable. And that's why arguments by analogy can be effective. In order to be effective, arguments by analogy require relevantly similar examples. So the two things that are being compared do not have to be similar in every respect. Only identical things share all their properties, and, and an identity is not an analogy. However, the two things compared in the analogy must be similar in a way relevant to the argument. Well, how do you know what's relevant? It depends on what the conclusion is, but the relevant similarity is one that falls under some underlying principle that the two things share that is relevant to the conclusion. So in the example argument about cats and dogs, the fact that both cats and dogs are mammals, for example, that's not relevant to whether they both meow. There are some things that are shared by all mammals, but calls or verbal communication is not one of them. So if you use the fact that they're both mammals to try to prove that because dogs gestate in the wombs of their mothers, therefore cats do as well, that would be a relevant similarity because it's something that invokes the underlying principle of them both being mammals. Let's look at another example of an argument by analogy. The universe is like a home and that humans dwell in both. Homes have designers and builders. Therefore, the universe has a designer and builder. This type of argument is often used in theology or philosophy of religion to show that the universe must have had a creator and that creator is God. Although, even if this argument is successful, it is a separate step to identify the designer and builder of the universe with God. It could be something else such as an alien intelligence, an artificial intelligence, a group of gods, etc. But let's just focus on this part of the argument, the part that invokes design and tries to say the universe must have had a designer. In order to evaluate this argument, we have to ask, are a home and the universe relevantly similar? So we're going to try to apply rule 12 to this argument. So to begin with, we look at the similarities of the universe and a home. In order to assess whether an argument by analogy follows rule 12, we have to look both at similarities and differences 
and then determine whether the differences are enough to break the argument. In terms of similarities, humans can live in both. Humans do live in homes, and they also live in the universe. And you could even expand on this point a bit more. In order for humans to be able to live in a home, the home has to be built to certain specifications. So it's not like any structure will do. It has to be one that takes in mind human beings, what they need to survive and flourish and be protected from the elements. Similarly, it's possible that if the universe had a different structure, then humans would not be able to exist here. So in that sense, there's a certain way in which both homes and the universe fit the needs of humans for survival. Uh, and you could also say that um, homes are like the universe in a kind of general way. They both have some kind of structure or form. However, this is a relatively weak similarity. Um, if you look at the, the way that a home has a structure, it's different from the structure of the universe. The structure of the universe includes things like galaxies, uh, like stars being collected into galaxies, galaxies being collected into clusters, clusters being collected into superclusters, and so on. Um, and that, that aspect of the universe's structure doesn't seem as directly relevant to humans being able to live there as the structure of a home does. But nevertheless, it is a generic similarity between them. If we look at differences, homes provide shelter from the elements and keep out unwanted animals or intruders. And the universe doesn't do this as a whole. So um, if you look at the universe, you know, there's plenty of opportunities for things in the universe who can live here just as well that are threats to humans. And whereas a home, because it has doors and windows that shut, it can be at least um, somewhat of a screen from, let's say, like animals coming in, like, you know, birds or bats flying in, um, wolves or bears or mountain lions coming in, stuff like that. Whereas the universe doesn't have the same sort of protection afforded to humans. We can be susceptible to many types of dangers in the universe. And that relates to the second more fundamental difference is that humans can survive in only a tiny fraction of the universe. If you think about your home uh, and almost all or maybe all of your home, you can survive there and do pretty well. The universe, there's only a tiny sliver that's not instantly lethal to humans. You know, we need a certain amount of atmosphere, certain composition of atmosphere, certain amount of gravity in order to stay healthy, etc. So it would be like someone built a home where in 99.99% of it, if you move to that part of the home, you would die instantly or in a few minutes. That would be a terrible design and a terrible architect. So this seems to be a really big difference between a home and the universe. So for our final evaluation, I think it's most reasonable to say they're not relevantly similar because of that point about survivability. The, the home seems more finely tuned to the needs for human survival and well-being than does the universe. So if the universe does have a designer, um, it's not in the same sense in which a home has a designer or architect. So effective arguments by analogy, how they work, is that they illustrate an underlying principle that the two things share. So these are the arguments by analogy that are logically strong. And what they're doing though is actually just serving as a, an illustration that helps an audience understand this deeper underlying principle. The analogy itself isn't doing much of the logical work, but let's take an example. Using a cell phone while driving is like driving while drunk because both distract the driver and increase the risk of accident. People shouldn't drive while drunk. Therefore, people shouldn't drive while using a cell phone. So the bold part is the underlying principle that both of these activities share. They distract the driver and increase the risk of accident. The reason why arguments by analogy can be useful is mainly in terms of persuading an audience and helping them understand your point. They don't actually add much logical or justificatory weight to the conclusion. However, this is still useful because the way humans learn new information oftentimes is by comparison to things they already know. So they move from something they're more familiar with to something they're less familiar with by making a connection or similarity. 
because most people are already familiar with the principle that drunk driving is dangerous and wrong and should be avoided, that can be leveraged to help understand and to help illustrate why driving while texting can also be dangerous. So you can actually make any argument by analogy valid. You do so by making the underlying principle shared by the two things in the analogy as one of your premises. So here's an example. People should not engage in an activity while driving that distracts them and increases the risk of accident. Driving while using a cell phone is an activity that distracts drivers and increases the risk of accident. Therefore, people shouldn't drive while using a cell phone. The first premise, which is in bold, is the underlying principle. So how does this differ from the actual argument by analogy? Well, if you look at it, you'll see there's no analogy. It's gone. So what does this tell you? It tells you the analogy is not actually necessary to prove the conclusion. It's not doing the logical lifting, the justifying work. The analogy can still be helpful, though, to help clarify the point you're making to an audience. It can be sometimes easier to grasp the meaning or significance of an underlying principle and how it's valid and relevant in this case by making the analogy. But this is making the argument more psychologically plausible and understandable, as opposed to making it more logically defensible. Let's look at a sample problem and we'll identify the analogy and then evaluate its effectiveness. The mugger who forces me to give him my wallet is not entitled to my money. A nation that conquers another nation in an unjust war is like a mugger. Both use violence to take what they want. Therefore, a nation that conquers another nation in an unjust war is not entitled to that nation's resources. This is an, an adaptation of an argument from the English political philosopher John Locke, which appeared in his work, The Second Treatise of Government. And it was very influential on a lot of later political theory. So we begin by identifying the analogy. A nation that conquers another nation in an unjust war is like a mugger. Both use violence to take what they want. Now it's time to try to uh, systematically look at this analogy for similarities and differences between the two things that are compared. Let's start with similarities. What are the similarities in these two cases between the nation and the mugger? They both use violence to take what belongs to someone else. And we could also add to this, they're doing it in a way that is unjust. It's not like the mugger is restoring property that was originally theirs. It's not like the mugger was themselves previously attacked by the person they're attacking. They're initiating the use of force or violence against someone else's property. What about some differences between these two cases? Well, the main difference is that a nation is bigger than one mugger. It's at a larger scale. And it's possible that sometimes our reasoning about what's right and wrong for individuals is not relevant to our reasoning about what's right and wrong for whole nations or groups or collectives of individuals. So what should our final evaluation of this argument by analogy be? Are the similarities more important than the differences or vice versa? These uh, two things are relevantly similar. Despite the fact that one is about an individual mugger and the other is about a whole nation, it seems that stealing is morally wrong, regardless of whether it's one person or many people. Another example of this is it doesn't really matter whether one individual murder takes someone's life or a whole nation kills many people wrongfully, many innocent people. Both are crimes. And in fact, if you look at the nations, it's not like the larger scale makes it better. It makes the crime even worse. So this looks like an effective argument by analogy. Let's look at another sample problem. Imagine that a department store offered a store-wide shopping spree for $5,000. After paying your fee, you could take anything you could carry out of the store, including designer clothes, expensive jewelry, and other luxury goods. Someone who paid the fee and walked out with a piece of bubble gum would be acting foolishly. Students who choose their college courses based on which courses are easiest or the most entertaining are like someone who picks up a piece of bubble gum in that imaginary shopping spree. Instead of looking for the most valuable learning experiences they can, 
They go for the mental bubble gum offered by the easiest courses. Thus, students who choose easy courses instead of the most stimulating and edifying courses are acting foolishly. So let's begin by identifying where the analogy is in this argument. It's in the statement, students who choose their college courses based on which courses are easiest or the most entertaining are like someone who picks up a piece of bubble gum in that imaginary shopping spree. So let's think of the similarities between these two things. They both involve choosing an item of lesser value when an item of greater value could be chosen in its place. Let's think about some differences between these two scenarios. Well, a big difference is that taking a more difficult course actually involves more work and effort than grabbing expensive items does in this analogy. So in this shopping spree, um, there's no suggestion that it's harder to get the more valuable items, that they're under lock and key or on higher shelves or anything. So that's really where this analogy breaks down. On the shopping spree, you can grab jewelry as easily as you can grab bubble gum. But when you're talking about taking college courses, it's not the same taking an easy course as a difficult course. And the difference is not trivial. You know, it could involve you know, dozens of hours of labor in addition to take the more difficult course. So let's look at our final evaluation. Which is more important, the similarities or the differences between these two things? This is not a relevantly similar analogy because of the fact that students do have to work significantly harder to take the difficult courses. Now, it doesn't mean that the conclusion of the argument is wrong. Remember that even if an argument is invalid or weak, it could still have a true conclusion. If the argument is flawed, all that means is that it fails to prove the conclusion does not mean that the conclusion is false. So if you take a more difficult course, then yeah, it could definitely help you out more in the long run. So that could be a reason itself for you to take it. However, the reason why this argument fails is because it ignores the difference between the upfront cost of taking a more difficult course versus taking a more valuable item. Next up, we have a new chapter, Arguments from Authority. This is basically appealing to expert sources to try to prove your conclusion.